to earth surface processes. And um, so uh, Dr. Nathan Brown is uh, assistant professor at the University of Texas Arlington. He did his PhD at US, uh, UCLA in geology, and then he went for a postdoc um, at UC Berkeley and also at UCLA. And uh, before we begin today's talk, I would just like to let everyone know that today's talk is being recorded. So it's already started, I guess. And uh, we will disable the chat during the talk. So, and we'll enable that uh, at the end of the talk. So if you have any questions, feel free to type in your questions and we can read them out for you. Or if you'd like to ask the questions yourself, feel free to do that by unmuting yourselves. And also just one um, last announcement, um, Landscape Life will be having an EGU session this year uh, about communicating geosciences. So um, spread the word. And if you'd like to like submit abstracts, uh, that would be great. Um, so finally, without delay, I'm going to invite Nathan to give his talk. So it's all yours, Nathan. Great, thank you, Aditi. Um, thanks so much to the organizers, uh, both current and past Landscapes Live has been such a fun thing. It was a real bright spot in the peak pandemic to be able to watch cool talks. And I'm so glad that it's um, continued. And uh, I feel no more nervous for this talk than I have for uh, most in the recent past because it's just such a um, high quality series. So I hope I'm able to, to do it justice. So today I'll be talking about um, using a relatively new tool, luminescence thermal chronology, to try and understand uh, rapidly evolving landscapes. If you've been watching um, this part of the literature, you've seen probably a lot of uh, these types of papers popping up, especially in the past 10 years or so, uh, accelerating towards present. Um, these are normally applied and really rapidly exhuming regions or in totally stable regions, uh, boreholes. And the reasons for that will probably become clear farther into the talk. But my guess is that the majority uh, of the audience uh, won't know much about this technique. So we're going to um, start with some of the basics. Uh, and we'll start with the real basics going back to 1663. So this is uh, Sir Robert Boyle, uh, considered by some to be sort of the original modern chemist. And he wrote these things about his friend's diamond. So he would hold the diamond up to a, a candle flame, and then he would immediately take it into the dark and he would watch as it would continue to glow. So it's uh, being stimulated, uh, but then even after the fact, it's giving off light. So this would be different than something like fluorescence. And he also noticed that when he was under his covers at night, if he held this diamond uh, onto his body, he could see that it would uh, glow, uh, even just with the slight amount of body heat he had. So uh, that was kind of a striking observation. You can do the same thing today uh, with a heater plate. So this uh, video will just show a piece of fluorite uh, that's been irradiated and placed on a hot plate. And what you see is as the temperature of this hot plate continues to rise, the emissions, the luminescence emissions from this sample get brighter and brighter. Eventually, you start to empty out the entirety of the signal. And even though the plate keeps getting warmer, the signal will eventually get dimmer as you totally empty this signal from the sample. So what's, what's going on here? What's uh, this luminescent system? How does it work? Today, we'll focus on um, feldspars. Um, uh, mostly because they work well from bedrock samples. Quartz typically uh, is overprinted by uh, inclusions um, 
and other non-target minerals, whereas feldspar tends to be bright enough on its own that you can use it straight out of bedrock. So for thermochronology, this is uh, a, a key um, uh, quality. So how do we describe the luminescence accumulation and decay within a grain of uh, K feldspar? Through time, this luminescent signal will build up due to exposure to ionizing radiation. So this is true in a body of sediment or in a column of rock. And it's due to a variety of uh, types of radiation. So if you were a grain of feldspar sitting inside this rock pictured here, uh, within the grain itself, you'd have some potassium 40 that's uh, self-dosing the mineral grain. And on your outer edge, you would also be experiencing some alpha radiation just on the outer crust. So beta radiation would be traveling uh, partway to all the way through the grain. Then you'd have some nearby gamma radiation that's traveling tens of centimeters. And if you're very near the surface, you'll be bombarded by cosmic radiation as well. So just the low levels of natural radioactivity within rock or sediment, that's enough to build this signal steadily through time until eventually you go from your traps being totally empty to entirely filled up. So the signal eventually does saturate where all of the luminescence uh, signal or the luminescence traps, these electron traps that we're monitoring, they're all full, at which point you can no longer uh, learn anything about uh, the finite timing you've experienced. But then the signal can also empty, uh, making it useful to geomorphologists. So it can empty either because of exposure to sunlight uh, or from exposure to heat. So what I'll show you now, uh, oh yeah, first let's do this. So the age of a sample that you would measure uh, depends on the amount of dose that your sample has accumulated and the natural dose rate. How quickly did it reach uh, that absorbed dose? And the age of what, you might be asking. Well, that would be the age since that mineral was last emptied by exposure to sunlight or exposure to heat. So you empty by those exposures and then you gradually build back up until you're full. There's a really useful complication here though, uh, which is that feldspars are sensitive to uh, a range of temperatures. There are a range of signals within a single feldspar grain uh, that have different thermal sensitivities. And so we're going to leverage that later in our talk. But first I wanna look out across a landscape and sort of give a shameless plug for luminescence in general because it's so useful uh, for understanding geomorphic processes. And I think today, especially we're uh, living in this sort of renaissance of using luminescence in non-traditional ways, um, many of which are really exciting uh, and still underdeveloped, underapplied. Here's a recent study, for example, uh, looking at uh, an apron of colluvium that's sitting just above this fault scarp. And what these workers have done, they've measured the, the natural luminescence intensity uh, across this whole region. And you'll see that these bluer colors are younger sediments. And these yellowish green are older. So you can have a sense just by luminescence age alone of what is this colluvial fill and what is the original scarp material. Um, this would be contrasted with traditional uh, luminescence dating where you collect uh, a sediment of tube from a target unit and you get one age for that, for that tube. Um, topical to today's discussion uh, is when you sample a rock outcrop from a rapidly exhuming region, you could get information about the thermal history of that rock. Um, so this would be a rock that starts out hot and as it nears the uh, atmosphere, it nears, goes through the upper crust, uh, 
begins to cool. And that's the signal that you're measuring. Or you could look on a smaller scale. So here you might have um, sampled through a soil profile. If you do that, as these authors did, you could look at um, how recently a grain has seen sunlight and then been mixed back down into the soil column. And so, for example, in this study, the authors found that um, the trend between the burial dose or the age and the depth suggests that the intensity of soil mixing is depth dependent. And this holds true uh, in a variety of climates across the world. So uh, you can use these luminescent signals within the soil profile to tell you not the original depositional age, but instead the soil mixing intensity. And then uh, finally, you could look at the outer surface of a rock body and look at how sunlight has bleached the luminescence signals within the upper centimeter or two and learn from that um, the duration of sunlight exposure, how long has that rock been exposed to direct sunlight, or if it's been exposed for a long time and erosion is significant, the erosion rate of that rock surface. So here's an example of uh, a new technology where you can directly collect uh, a luminescence image of a slab. So this slab of rock is perpendicular to the surface and the coloring shows you how uh, full the luminescence signal is. So this blue signal is totally bleached out. This red signal is totally saturated. And in between, you see this transition zone. So the sunlight would have been bleaching steadily this outer surface and the bleaching front has migrated down uh, to some depth. In this case, it looks like about uh, 10, 15 millimeters beneath the surface. So if you were to, for example, take a drill core throughout uh, an entire rock column, what you would see is in the uppermost centimeter or two, you'd have this region where there's enough sunlight getting through that sunlight caused detrapping is the main effect. And your traps would be empty because of that. Your luminescent signal would be zero. As soon as you get deeper into the cold, dark body of the rock, then trapping would be the dominant um, behavior and your signals would be saturated if this has been at steady temperature for a long time. If you go to a kilometer or two beneath the surface, you'll eventually, eventually reach uh, temperatures where thermal detrapping, even though it's dark, thermal detrapping starts to dominate. And again, you have empty traps, you have a luminescent signal of zero. Um, so this is kind of the region where we'll be um, thinking today. How do you make these measurements? Uh, so here is the standard instrumentation that we use. You can see, uh, in this case, we're doing a single grain measurement. Uh, you can see all these grains mounted on this specialized holder. Within the instrument, there are uh, stimulation diodes uh, and a photomultiplier tube. So we can use uh, really intense infrared, for example, light stimulation, or we could heat the sample either way. And we'll do that to produce a very faint blue emission from this sample that we'll measure with our photomultiplier tube. Uh, the intensity of light is something like 10 to the 18 times greater uh, in these stimulating uh, colors than the color coming out. So the, the filters that we use are very important. And we also have a radioactive source. So we can bring our grains over here and we can irradiate them to mimic their natural uh, accumulation of, of dose. Um, so by doing these two things, we can 
fill the luminescent signal up and see how it depletes with different heat conditions, for example. Measurements look something like this. Uh, so here you can see these single grains being measured. This is the brightest, so presumably the oldest grain we have here, uh, or perhaps the most sensitive. And here would be uh, a luminescence image of a slice of rock. So here's the luminescence intensity from that rock slice. Um, and you can see in this case, uh, the brightest spots are the most potassic, um, which is why we tend to target potassium feldspars. So for the remainder of the talk, now that we have a basic understanding for what luminescence is, we're first going to look at using luminescence for uh, paleothermometry, for estimating some uh, average thermal condition. So I'll give some theoretical background, and then we'll look at an application in a glacial valley. And then we'll look at a dynamic thermal situation uh, where you have rapidly tectonically zooming uh, bedrock uh, next to the San Andreas Fault in Southern California. And then some concluding thoughts. So when we're thinking about using luminescence for thermochronology, the analogy that I like best is um, this leaky bucket analogy that uh, Benny Gralnick did a good job of, of laying out uh, in this paper. So in this scenario, uh, we can think of the gain rate and the loss rate. Um, the gain rate is independent of temperature. It only depends on how radioactive is your body of rock. And the loss rate depends strongly, depends exponentially on the temperature. So depending on the balance between these two, you will be somewhere between totally empty and totally full. So we'll call this the fractional saturation. If it's zero, the traps are totally empty. One is totally full, it's saturated. So the loss rate goes like this, um, where temperature sits over here. This would be the activation energy or the trap depth uh, of your luminescent signal that you're targeting. This is just the Boltzmann constant that relates the two. So it goes like this. As the temperature of your grain uh, increases, the loss rate increases. So you could think of the hole in the bucket getting bigger. And as it does, then your fractional saturation level will begin to decrease. Now, here is the part that I hinted at earlier uh, and where it becomes really useful. So K feldspar thermoluminescence, TL, this just means we're heating the sample to get the signal in. So K feldspar uh, traps have a range of thermal stability, even within a single mineral grain. So in one way of thinking about it, it's as if you have a range of thermal chronometers. You have multiple thermal chronometers within your single grain. Um, and what you often see is the least stable of those may be totally empty for a given thermal history. And the most stable, might be totally saturated. And in between, you have this, uh, this dynamic range where some of the traps are beginning to fill and have ages associated with them. So this is where you can learn really rich information about a sample's thermal history. Uh, why is this? Uh, well, one explanation is there's a range of uh, these activation energies present in a sample. Um, So then we could imagine these two uh, simple scenarios. If you uh, start with a uh, totally filled cold sample and you begin to heat it, what you would see is these least stable sites emptying first. And if you continue to heat the sample, eventually even your most stable site will empty. Uh, by comparison, cooling, you might start with uh, totally empty traps. So for example, if you're exhuming a rock from mid-crustal depths to the surface, this would be the scenario. So what would happen is as you approach progressively cooler temperatures, 
your most stable trap, your most stable thermal chronometer, if you want, will start to build up that signal first. Eventually, it becomes saturated. And uh, if you reach cool enough temperatures, maybe your least stable trap would then begin to accumulate as well. Now, the really cool thing is you can progressively measure these different thermal chronometers, these different stabilities, just by heating your sample up slowly. So this is actually the measurement that we're making in the lab is we uh, put these grains on the instrument and we progressively heat them. We linearly heat them from room temperature to about 500 degrees uh, Celsius. And as we do that, uh, we get emissions first from these less stable sites and progressively through to the most stable. So here's kind of what the measurement would look like um, as we have this measured, uh, this measurement temperature increasing, you would observe some of the traps which are totally empty, and then these partially full traps going up to entirely full traps. And this is where all of the information about your sample's thermal history resides. This is an actual measurement. Um, so this is thermal luminescence. This is us heating that sample to get the luminescence intensity out. For the next few figures, we're going to use a shorthand, T half. This is a measured quantity, and it's just the, the measurement temperature at half maximum intensity. So it's a shorthand way of saying, what's the least stable population that you're getting out? Um, so, for example, if you measured these green emissions, you would have less stable sites that are occupied naturally. And if you measure these blue emissions, you would have only the most stable sites occupied. Those less stable sites would be empty, and so you wouldn't measure any emissions from them. In other words, if you observe a lower T half value, uh, you're seeing that less thermally stable sites are occupied. A simpler way to say that is samples that are kept at colder ambient temperatures can maintain lower T half values. And this is a pretty robust result. You can do this um, easily on your instrument. So here, um, We've irradiated a sample and then held it at these different temperatures for different durations. So for example, here we hold the sample at, uh, we give it a dose, we hold it at 50 degrees C for um, 10 or 30 or 100 or 300 or 1000 seconds. And then we measure how this T half value evolves depending on the thermal exposure. You can also use simple models of what's happening uh, behind the scenes to predict this same behavior. And uh, it holds up um, empirically uh, for natural samples. So in this case, we collected a variety of um, drill core subsamples from the USGS Core Research Center in Denver. And the purpose of collecting these samples is in all three of these sites, they've been um, thermally tectonically stable for uh, a million years or more. So that's far greater than the time uh, needed for luminescent signals to reach equilibrium. And they have a range of natural hold temperatures, natural burial temperatures. So ranging from about negative four to just over 60 degrees C. So here are the three drill cores and the symbols are the depths collected. What we can then do is plot up the um, measured signals from samples at these different burial temperatures. So they're color coded here uh, according to their burial temperature, their steady state temperature. And what you see is as you'd expect, the samples that are kept cold naturally have lower T half values. They have charge present in less thermally stable sites. 
and those samples that are hot naturally have higher TF values. Uh, only the most thermally stable sites are occupied uh, in those samples. And it's a pretty uh, direct relationship between that steady state burial temperature and the observed T half value. So how might something like this be useful? Um, well, here's a series of samples that we collected from the Beartooth Glacial Valley. Uh, uh, in Montana. So this is just north of, um, of Yellowstone Park. Uh, if you've ever driven north to Red Lodge, Montana, you'll have gone on this uh, scenic highway. It's really beautiful. Um, and it's sort of a textbook example of a, a U-shaped glacial valley. Um, so we originally had collected these samples for uh, a different purpose, but after we made these, um, these stable drill core measurements, I was curious what would happen if uh, we would measure the T half values from these glacial valley samples and compare them against the stable drill cores. So that's what we did. Um, here are the measured T half values for these glacial valley samples. These are taken all across the valley, uh, high points, low points. Um, so there's going to be some natural thermal variability uh, today. Um, and then what we're going to do is very simple. All we're going to do is take the, the measured T half values from these glacial valley samples, and we're going to project them onto this drill core trend. So what we're doing is we're saying, we know the geologic temperature for these drill core samples. And let's ask these glacial valley samples, what's your temperature? So we measure the T half value, we project it on uh, to this drill core trend. And what we get is a predicted uh, mean geologic temperature of uh, just under zero degrees C. We can compare that with the long-term instrumental record from the nearby town of Red Lodge. And there's a temperature offset of uh, just under 20 degrees C. Now, uh, Red Lodge is at a slightly lower elevation than the majority of these samples. So there's going to be a, a natural temperature offset there anyways. Um, but it is interesting, at least, that these samples are reporting a colder mean temperature. Uh, how would you interpret that? Well, one important question is, uh, What's the averaging time scale for this colder temperature? We can predict some colder temperature, but uh, what's the, the time scale that's relevant? So what we did here is we estimated uh, what the age is, what the apparent age is at that T half value. So this is a simple measurement to make. Uh, and when we do this for all of these samples, you end up with ages that look like this. So there's a wide range. Um, but the, the striking thing to me about these is they, they kind of uh, smell glacial. They look like they're um, roughly corresponding to uh, time scales of known glacial activity in this area. So for example, if we plot um, these ages, so shown in pink at the left here, the y-axis is sample age. And then here we have uh, different glacial activity studies from nearby. What you see is there's broad coincidence um, between uh, LGM activity uh, and pre-LGM activity. Um, so it seems that uh, these temperatures are reporting time since, uh, perhaps since uh, glacial erosion or at least that the, uh, that the temperatures that we're sensing are the mean temperature sense uh, deglaciation in the case of these youngest samples. So this is uh, a promising, if um, preliminary result. So now let's uh, see what happens when you have a more dynamic situation, samples that are uh, rapidly uh, experiencing ongoing cooling. 
So in this case, we're looking at a thermochronology uh, case study. So a bit of um, additional context here. What would happen if your sample is cooling? How would that affect your uh, trap populations? So we'll do a simple thought experiment. We know already that we have this range of thermal stability present in our feldspar mineral. And there's also uh, this distribution of available trap types. So you might have some maximum number of uh, intermediate stability sites, only a very few that are totally stable and a very few that are uh, minimally stable. So th this is another um, basic observation. So what happens if you hold your sample at a set temperature through time? Well, those sites that can accumulate will. So if you hold it at that same temperature indefinitely, or for at least about 200,000 years, then all of those sites will fill up. So this is uh, one of the reasons why um, the studies published to date mostly involve rapidly exhuming regions or stable drill cores. Stable drill cores fit the bill here. It's been at the same temperature for a long time. All the traps that can fill at this temperature have, uh, whereas um, these rapidly exhuming regions haven't had enough time to totally fill uh, these traps. So you still have time information preserved. But what would happen now if we drop the temperature? Well, if you drop the temperature, then you open up new sites that can begin to accumulate. They weren't thermally stable at the higher temperature, but now that you've lowered the temperature, they are. So they begin to accumulate. But if you drop temperature again, well, now you've opened up this third domain. And the interesting thing to notice here is if you're rapidly cooling, then you're preserving multiple stages in this example of, uh, of cooling. So you could extrapolate this to a continuous case where your sample is continuously rapidly cooling and how you'd be progressively opening up uh, less and less stable sites. And so until uh, a given site totally saturates, you're preserving time temperature history uh, all throughout this population. So that's what we're going to leverage for this uh, final case study. So for these samples, we're going to um, the Ukaipa Ridge, which is the fastest exhuming block within the broader uh, San Bernardino Mountains. So this is the main strand of the San Andreas Fault here. Uh, this is the transverse ranges where uh, uh, all of these um, giant mountain belts are being built up uh, due to compressive tectonic forces. Los Angeles is off the map uh, to the left here. And this is what it looks like in this area, uh, extremely uh, rugged, steep topography dominated by giant rock falls, um, debris flows. It's actually been in the news recently. You may have seen uh, some of these images um, in the past uh, month or two. Um, in particular, you may have seen this image or there's one of a sort of a pulsed debris flow that was um, filling up this, this channel. Um, so it's, it's a, an inherently instable uh, landscape. Um, and the measured uh, erosion rates are uh, pretty astronomical. We're talking multiple millimeters per year uh, of, of erosion here. So this was uh, a good place to field test this type of measurement. So what I'll show you here are um, some of the samples that we've collected compared against previously collected samples. So the first previously collected sample group uh, would be these in these plus marks. These are apatite helium samples uh, collected by uh, James Spatilla and others. I'll also show you some uh, beryllium 10 uh, catchment average erosion rates. Um, so these uh, include some, some new measurements. Um, 
as well as some published. So these come from the San Gorgonio block, from the Kuiper Ridge block. Um, so these are the two main tectonic domains here. And then lastly, I'm going to overlay some uh, luminescence uh, erosion rates. So these have been converted into erosion rates, assuming something about the thermal structure of these blocks. Um, the luminescence samples, when I plot them, the size of the symbol is proportional to the erosion rate. And the shape of the symbol uh, tells you the age range that we're looking at. So again, we have this range of thermal chronometers present in your grain. And so you can look at um, the oldest ages that are recorded uh, or younger uh, or younger ages. So here we're looking anywhere from 10 to about 100,000 years is a time range preserved in most of these samples. So when I plot these up, um, for example, here you can see that the erosion rate is fairly consistent across all three time periods for this sample. Um, and they're colored according to the different regions on this block. Um, we won't get into it today, um, but one interesting outcome is we can see uh, a paleo surface preserved here. So this, this sample in particular was much uh, a much lower erosion rate than any of the others. And when you zoom into this region, uh, you find that it is actually uh, a small holdout of, of a paleo surface. Uh, there's a sharp break in slope. And so our interpretation is it just hasn't yet felt uh, the erosion of these, uh, these rapidly eroding hill slopes nearby, but soon it will also uh, succumb to this inward propagating erosion. So uh, one way that we can digest these erosion rates is just to compare them uh, like this. So what you're going to look at now uh, are the luminescence erosion rates uh, for different regions. So each row is a different region in this area. And the x-axis is the averaging time scale for these measurements. So you have one averaging time scale for each bin, and it ranges from you know, 10 to 100,000 years. Then next to this, we can plot up the catchment averaged uh, beryllium 10 erosion rates. So these will have an averaging time scale of about 1,000 years, given how rapidly it's exhuming. And we can also plot up the uh, low temperature thermal chronology results, which have an averaging time scale uh, of millions of years. Um, so one thing that you might immediately wonder is, do these agree with each other? And we were really happy to see that, yes, generally speaking, there is agreement among these three techniques, even though, you're looking at very different averaging time scales. So a uh, thousand years, 10 to a hundred thousand years, a million years. Broadly speaking, we're getting similar erosion rates uh, despite that disparity in time scale. Um, so that was uh, an encouraging initial observation. The nice thing about these luminescence measurements in particular though, is the time resolution that you, that you gain. So you can see things, for example, like a general deceleration uh, in erosion in this uh, San Gregorio region uh, and other regions where you sustain this really high erosion rate to present. Another sort of thing that uh, I imagine this audience would be interested in uh, doing with data like this would be looking at how these outcrop scale erosion rates uh, vary with different uh, landscape metrics. So for example, you can uh, look at the relationship between the luminescence erosion rate and the elevation um, for different time slices. So here is that relationship 10 to 20,000 years ago, 50 to 60,000 years ago, or 90 to 100,000 years. 
Now, some samples drop off on this oldest time slice uh, just because they don't have any um, cooling ages that old. In other words, they're exhuming faster than the others. But this uh, type of analysis is really useful um, for learning in situ erosional patterns. So in this case, uh, we see a general trend of increasing relief. We have higher erosion rates at lower elevations. So we would expect the, the relief of this landscape to increase with time. Um, and then the last thing I want to show you with this site is uh, the type of story that you might be able to tell with, with data like this. Um, so here is the Ukiper Ridge block. Um, we're looking uh, sort of down the barrel of what might be a deadfault, uh, currently debated, but, but we think that this strand uh, may actually host activity because of some differences in thermal history that we've observed. But what we see when we plot up the um, sort of fine scale erosion rate history of these five samples in particular, coming up two different draws up this mountain face, is a kind of a rich story. So it's been predicted in the past that the west side of this block uh, should probably be exhuming faster than the east side, just because of the subsurface block geometry. And we do see that. Uh, we see that uh, the history of at least uh, these four samples seems to be shared, but with a three to four time uh, magnitude shift uh, between them. So the west side does seem to be exhuming faster. This sample seems to be somewhat decoupled from the others. Um, and that's one indicator that perhaps this, this fault is hosting vertical motion, that, that the vertical, uh, that the cooling history of this sample could be decoupled from the cooling history of these. But when you zoom in on these two samples in particular, uh, you see something even more uh, interesting, I think. Uh, since about 30,000 years, they have a shared thermal history, more or less. There is significant uh, noise in these measurements. But prior to 30,000 years, we see that this sample up here, higher up in the catchment, uh, was apparently eroding faster, exhuming faster. And you can do a real simple-minded calculation, say what, what would be the erosional length predicted by that difference we observe. And it comes out to uh, a scale comparable to sort of the scale of gullying uh, uh, in this catchment. So this, this might be uh, us directly observing the, the carving of this of this um, higher relief feature here. So we've got all of these exciting results. What comes next? How do we uh, develop this from here? I think with it being a relatively young technique, it will be nice to develop some field tests, um, collecting samples where we have known uh, geologic thermal history. So we've done boreholes, we've done rapidly exhuming samples. Um, one thing I'd like to try in the future is recent contact heating samples. How do we do uh, in cases like that? Um, it would be really great uh, to compare against other thermal chronometers, but oftentimes um, those are developed on uh, intrusions that are millions of years old, and that won't work well for us. Um, another thing would be to, uh, whenever possible, uh, compare directly our luminescence uh, exhumation histories with other thermal chronometers um, or other erosion meters uh, like uh, beryllium 10. As we get near the surface, we also have to start thinking about um, more subtle features. Um, so with the most rapidly exhuming samples, this may not be so much of a problem just because uh, these samples spend so little time in the upper meter or so on their way up. 
Um, but especially with older samples or samples that are eroding slowly, uh, you'll start to uh, need to consider things like uh, diurnal solar heating, uh, the influence of subglacial water, of wildfires. Um, and so developing clever ways of, of sampling uh, could become important. Mm, this should be two of two. And then, then lastly, um, the kinetic models behind these things um, need to be refined a lot. Um, it's a really complicated problem. Uh, and so we have these rich observational data sets and it's, it remains really difficult to fit all of the observations with, uh, with a single model. So uh, further work is needed there. Uh, this last one is um, just sort of for the, for the luminescence nerds in the audience, uh, specific challenges for kinetics. And really what I wanna communicate with this is just there are significant uh, uncertainties still on exactly how, um, how the math of this thing works. Um, so, so more is needed there. The takeaways, uh, thermoluminescence from K. Feldsbar grains records rich information about uh, a sample's quaternary temperature history. When these samples are at constant temperatures, the signal is sensitive, uh, is observed to be sensitive to temperatures ranging from negative four to 60 degrees uh, annual temperature. In active landscapes, these signals do seem to encode uh, recent geomorphic changes. Uh, again, we can't look farther back in time than about 200,000 years, but uh, in most actively eroding regions, this is a, a really useful time scale. Um, and quantitatively, uh, interpreting this time temperature history that produced the observed signals remains a significant challenge, uh, at least partly because of the the compound nature of the TL curve. A lot of our thermal chronometers are overlapping in their emissions. And so, so disentangling that is, is quite a challenge. Um, but I would like to thank everyone for, uh, for attending. And there are many collaborators who have helped uh, bring this work to life. So I'd like to thank them also. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Nathan. It was a really, really interesting talk. Um, and yeah, we are now open for questions. So if anybody has questions, they can type it in the chat and we can read it out. Or you can ask questions yourselves um, as people prefer. But um, yeah, well, I, I guess while people are typing questions, I can ask one, it's it's a very general one about, uh, I think one of the last ones, uh, examples that you gave mm -hmm. from the Bernardino Mountains. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so over there, uh, you had those TL ages with the erosion rates. So I was wondering what the ages were on. They were like the moraines that were there that you showed or um, those are not yeah. TL ages, were they? Or, or cell? ages um, yeah they're they're tl ages from bedrock outcrops yep so we're just going let's see if i have a uh one of these samples so here you can see this mm -hmm. is my phd advisor ed mm -hmm. he's just got his little chisel and uh sledgehammer there and he's detaching uh in situ rock from this this outcrop so yeah it's just go up bang it off and it's the, the outcrop erosion rate, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so it's from the outcrop itself. Yep, yeah, that's right, yep. The rock, yeah. Yeah, oh, I mean, okay. theoretically, you could do some sort of like uh, detrital thermochronology, uh, like especially mm -hmm. one of these, you know, bigger things, you could get, you could get a thermal history from that and assume something about where it came from or you could measure a bunch of them in the same way that you mm -hmm. would do it other detrital yeah. thermochronometers, but that hasn't been done yet. Okay, yeah. Oh, thanks. And I see that we have a couple of questions already. Um, we can start going through them one by one. So um, there's a question by Satish who says that I have five samples from a two meter thick sand bed, each on every 20 to 40 centimeter gap. 
samples are younger than 1,000 uh, years, I guess. Uh, now, all the samples are given a similar DE value, and over dispersion is more than 60%. They're calculating age using minimum age model, but the lowest sample is giving younger age than the upper ones. How is this possible? Is there any <laughs> method to remove sensitivity of younger samples or some type of yeah, taking care to for the complete dating process. I think it's a very specific yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are many ways it can go wrong. Yeah, how long do you got? It's a <clears throat> yeah. It's that's a a very common challenge. High over dispersion. You've got um, really high variability, more variability than you can explain with known sources of error. Um, so yeah, I I think it would depend a lot on the specifics of sample preparation and um, which signals you're measuring and specifics of that site. So I think I would need to know more before I could give an informed answer there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think there's a continuation of that. I think they exposed the samples to white light and uh, white light, mobile light for 30 to 20 seconds or something. But there was not much difference in DE values from non-exposed samples. And oh, right. Wild. So that might be part of the problem that you're measuring a, a signal that's that's uh, not super bleachable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll let Misha take the other questions. Yeah. Um, so I think we don't have uh, any other questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We just uh, um, there's some good causes, comments about the, the great great talk uh, that oh, I agree with. Um, but if anybody wants to ask uh, Nathan directly and not through the chat, feel free to unmute yourself. You should be able to do it. I guess I, um, maybe I can have a, a, a quick question if that's okay. Um, so, I mean, we talk a lot about this in geochronology in general about uncertainties attached to these methods and when it's appropriate to use these methods and whether they marry up nicely with the wavelengths of the processes that we're using. So are we actually able to capture these things um, mm -hmm. using the techniques that we're using? Um, I was just wondering, um, as somebody who's a complete novice to this uh, new approach, um, you know, could you talk a little bit about those uncertainties? I know you mentioned it a little bit throughout your talk, but um, could you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, how we have to maybe approach that? Um, uh, in the film? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a huge, critically important question. I mean, that, in some ways, that's that's everything, right? What's uh, what's signal? What's noise? So um, the uncertainties that I showed in all of my plots are sort of internal uh, sample to sample uh, uncertainties. There, are, there's a whole other branch uh, of uncertainties to do with uh, equally important to do with the, the thermal field that's involved. And like you like you say, um, with wavelength of topography is is a good example. So as as you're far below the surface, and you sort of have these. Uh, uh, relatively uniform isotherms, but as you have rapidly zooming topography, when you get close to the surface, you have these um, these shorter wavelength deformations, um, and and those can evolve. So if your block is is coming up quickly and then it stalls, you'll have these um, this advected heat that then dissipates downward, and so it's a really dynamic thing. Those uncertainties are are hard to deal with. Um, something like p-cube um, isn't uh, isn't built to deal with uh, such low temperatures uh, by default and I'm not good enough at Fortran to to <laughs> adjust it so so others are thinking about that problem uh, better than I have um, but yes uncertainties there are huge variability from sample to sample these are really time consuming measurements um, because you need to irradiate them up to the point where they're saturated. And that takes a long time. Um, so finding more efficient ways to do these measurements uh, to get better uh, uh, statistics related to the variability one grain to the next, that's important. Um, yeah, there's a huge component of, uh, of error analysis that we need to deal with more completely. Thank you, thanks. Um, we do have a question, another question in the chat. Um, 
Sorry. Sorry. Uh, can you explain the graph which is showing the relationship between temperature and luminescence signal? Um, uh, I don't know what the, I would just explain it, I guess. I'm not quite uh, sure which plot that is. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not totally sure either. Let's see. Um, between temperature and luminescence signal. Uh, oh, maybe it's the, um, with the stable drill core samples, maybe. Is that, uh, maybe if the, person with that question could uh, verify, I'll bring that one up anyways. Uh, so in the chat is, uh, forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, uh, Ragu? Don't know if you want to turn on your microphone just to confirm that um, Nathan has the right plot. I could answer it as if it's this plot, uh, but I don't want to make a bad assumption. Well, perhaps we can uh, move on to another question, and then um, if we can kind of work out whether that's the plot, just so that you know, I'm conscious of time. So we've yeah, got sure. a question here that says, "It's great to see the changes in more recent times within a hundred thousand years in bedrock. Can we learn anything to?" Uh, uh, analysis uh, detrital samples or the analysis of detrital, sam detrital samples, uh, what will be the challenges? Yeah, uh, I, again, I think detrital samples would be a really exciting way forward. Um, the challenge would just be time. And, I mean, it, that's um, at, at this point, I mean, it's going to be, you need samples that are bigger than grains, right? There needs to be a dark interior of the rock. If you have grains, uh, then they'll be bleached through due to sunlight. So you have lost all information about thermal history. So you need, you know, at least cobble size samples. And so if you need good counting statistics, I think people who do detrital work, say, you know, 100 samples or more, something like this. So for, for one sample, then all of a sudden you're slicing open uh, 100 samples, bringing them all up to saturation, it becomes almost uh, an intractably long amount of time to, to measure that one sample. So if there were a clever way to do that faster, then yeah, that would be really cool. Um, and you could interpret in the same way that you would traditional detrital thermal chronology um, with the caveat that it's gotta be relatively big sizes. Um, but yeah, I think that would be really cool to try. Okay, so I, I think yeah, Raghu hasn't replied. So I guess you can just oh yeah, he means the steady temperature graph. This one, yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, right. So the idea here is um, we know um, the long term temperature of these samples because the the thermal field beneath them is well measured, and so we know their long term temperature is this x axis. Uh, so this is the known uh, thermal history, if you want. And then this would be the measured quantity, that t half value. So we just put the samples in the machine, uh, measure their glow curve, and um, extract this, this t half value. So all we're doing is just plotting one against the other. And the point of this plot is there's a clear relationship um, T half uh, is a good predictor of the long-term temperature. That would be the point there. So there are many cases, in other words, where um, you won't know uh, the, for whatever reason, the long-term storage of a sample, but you could measure the T half value and that could tell you something about the long-term storage temperature. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I don't think we have um, any more questions. If there are any last questions, um, Michelle, Lizzie, or... And if not, then I have one. Um, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, last one. Just like with respect to uh, something that was asked about uh, detrital samples. 
mm. and we're looking at detrital samples. So because you're looking at individual uh, feldspar brain, is that why it's easier to do detrital samples? Because when you're looking at a lot of sediment and detrital, say feldspar or quartz from within the sediment, they could be from a lot of sources, right? Um, but when you're talking about your work, you're basically looking at bigger cobbles or gravel, but not at sediment itself, right? Right. So there are many cases where you, many types of luminescence measurements where you could do single grain. So um, uh, where you could just collect grains of sand and look at yeah, their yeah. luminescence sensitivity to get an idea of provenance. And people are mm -hmm. doing that a lot today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but for, for my application um, for thermochronology, because sunlight would erase our valuable information, we have to take mm -hmm. uh, rocks that are dark. And so the only resetting mechanism in their history has been heat. So we isolate, we make sure that sunlight has no effect there. So for that reason, that's why we have to um, only look at outcrops. So in the context of a detrital study, if you wanted to do that, you would need uh, detritus that's big enough to be dark on the inside. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 No, that's, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. How it's, it all, yeah. How different yeah, yeah. Yeah, mechanisms and how you put like different things together. No, it's yeah. super interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I think we have no more questions. So yeah. Thanks a lot, Nathan, for joining yeah, thanks us. So much. It was a super interesting talk and yeah, a nice perspective on yeah all the applications available uh, with luminescence and things like that. Well, thanks for uh, the invitation. Yeah. This is really fun. Yeah, 